no matter what you guys do in life, no matter what you wear, where you come from, you can be an all-star. Yeah. All yeah. yeah. Tonight, we are all-stars. What are we doing today? We're shooting our music video for all-stars. So our next scene is we're going to play Pete <laughs> <laughs> and Nacho with a champion. Let me introduce you to the star today, Jackie, number one champion of China. Get him ready for dancing. We are about to shoot dance choreography for all stars. Four hot girls and two hot Ferraris, and one hot girl and one hot motorcycle. Because we're all stars. Now we're on top of a bus shooting all of Hong Kong, because that's how we do it. Yeah! yeah! They're the first ever Pan-Asian girl band, like the Spice Girls of Asia. We're gonna spice up their lives by slam dunking on them. <laughs> That's the truth. They're about to get and it. And B-Boy rocking them. Let's show them what we got, fellas. Let's go. Yo. Go watch this. Watch this. You're going down. Yeah. This is Butsabar. Her name means spice flower. She lives in the waste grounds next to a concrete factory on the outskirts of Bangkok. The area is a dumping ground. Broken glass, ceramic tiles and all kinds of human rubbish litter the floor. There is no supply of fresh water and the stagnant pools that surround this site are very polluted. Butsabar lives here with a mahout and two helpers. Every night they walk the streets of Bangkok, venturing into the city's tourist areas, trying to earn enough money to survive. This is their story. They said that these temples were built by the first masons who built the Temple of Salomon in Jerusalem. The Acropolis site of Baalbek is fascinating. Humans have lived around Baalbek for at least 4,000 years. The site was built and rebuilt using very advanced techniques. It was built to last. Let's look at the temple site in more detail. Now look at these amazing limestone blocks. Look at the joints, they're staggering. And look at this rock, dead flat for about eight meters. That's incredible workmanship. And here is the magnificent temple of Bacchus. The roof structure is absolutely beautiful. And look at this intricate carving. They say it's the finest example of the Roman Empire. But is it all Roman? Now look at this at the Temple of Bacchus. We have these huge blocks and I can't even slip the wedge between these joints. And yet they're huge and vast and stretch for at least 90 meters each side. But if you think the podium at the Temple of Bacchus is big, look behind me at the Temple of Jupiter. It's even larger. Look at the size of these columns, they're massive. They're 22 metres tall, 2.5 metres across the base and on top a 5 metre header which holds the whole structure together.
here we have the uh, part of the column that's 2.5 meters diameter and the three holes to join the columns together and we have an example of the copper sleeves used. Originally there were 54 of these columns, today there is only six left. Building techniques demonstrated here are truly astounding, but wait, I want to show you something even more impressive. Now this is a part of the temple at Baalbek called the Trilaton. It consists of three huge blocks. Each one of the Trilaton blocks is around about 22 metres long. How they got these blocks from a quarry probably a kilometre away up to here is a mystery. It's just incredible. Who could have moved and carved these massive blocks? Were they the mythical race of giants under King Nimrod who have faded into obscurity? The remains of these huge base stones were used by later civilizations to rebuild Baalbek. And here we are at the quarry in Baalbek and look at this monster. This is one of the largest blocks in the world and over the road is one that's even longer, 22 metres in fact. But look at the depth of this one and look at the bedrock where it was quarried out of. Precise lines of cut, cut with steel, we're not sure. Oh wow, this is detached. It's above the ground, it's not actually part of the ground. That means it's been moved. And look at this spur that's been cut out from the rock face so that it sits above the ground. This is incredible. This is the largest block in the world. It's colossal. Look at that, 4.5 metres high. 25 metres long. Weighs over a thousand tons. How would you move this block? So how was this thousand ton monster moved? It's over a kilometre of Baalbek, over rough terrain. Now some say rollers, certainly in the case of the Egyptian pyramids, we had 15 ton blocks, not a thousand ton blocks. They could have been moved by rollers, but this monster, I don't think so. Rollers would have been crushed, might have taken up to 10,000 people to drag it along. It's a mystery. The damage of Baalbek is not only due to earthquakes. There is deposition of rubble, till and clay over its body. When Roberts reached Baalbek, he portrayed a site partially obscured by rubble. In this regard, it's like the Egyptian monuments, most of which were buried by sand. Even today we can see the previous level of the rubble at the Temple of Bacchus. Above that, there's graffiti. Below it, there's none whatsoever. This indicates 10 metres of rubble buried this wall. It was the German archaeologist under Wilhelm II who first revealed the depth of the damage. This was certainly not placed by the occupiers, so what agent caused it to be dumped over and beyond the entire huge megalithic site? In nearby Byblos, some 70 kilometres away, we again see Phoenician sites buried under many metres of rubble. In fact, a tsunami in around 500 AD ravaged the whole of the Lebanese coastline, burying Beirut, Byblos and other cities. This was accompanied by extremely destructive earthquakes. And this was merely the last of a devastating series that have ravaged this area. In the close of the early Bronze Age, Harvey Weiss notes extreme flooding in the local Syrian rivers despite drought and winds that persisted for some three centuries. Erratic and chaotic weather conditions led to unusual flooding and earth deposits. Rubble and muck may have been washed down from the Lebanese mountain range that Baalbek nestles under. Let's take a closer look at the layers of dirt at the quarry site. 
stratigraphy analysis may reveal what happened here. And look at this compact layer here, it's about 300 millimetres thick, rolled, broken sandstone, then some muddy stuff, and look, another slightly less thick layer, but bits of limestone in it, and then more mud. What's it all mean? Can't see anything living in this. It's obviously been washed down in some sort of event. So what happened here? Swift deposition or slow deposition? These are one of the things we've got to think about. Look. This evidence shows that flooding took place here. And on top of this, there's two distinct charcoal layers at the site indicating that some sort of fiery destruction took place. Today we see the Acropolis of Baalbek in ruins. Many civilizations have had their influence here. Our only definitive knowledge is from the time of the Romans, who rebuilt it around 100 AD under the emperors Nero and Trajan. They consulted it as an oracle. Let's take a closer look at the mythology of this era to see what insights we can gather about the ancient environment and the religious influences of the time. In these days it had three temples dedicated to three deities. Baal, king of the gods, we now recognise as the Roman god Jupiter. Secondly came Bacchus, also known as Mercury, was worshipped with full Bacchalian rites. The third deity was the mysterious Athena, or as we now know her, Venus. These citizens were petrified of Baal, for he was god of the dark cloud, king of the gods. All these deities were sky gods or planets with real influence over the people's daily lives. Eventually these sky gods took on human forms and personalities. Baalbek's history certainly reaches back beyond the Romans. The Phoenicians, Israelites and probably other conquerors played their part in the history of the mighty Acropolis. In a prison cell on the Thai-Myanmar border, police are holding their latest suspect in the battle against drugs. He's just 14 years old. We're protecting his identity because he is a minor. He says he didn't know that when he handed over 20 methamphetamine pills to a buyer, the buyer was actually a police informant. The lure of easy money outweighed any risk of arrest. When I sold the drugs, I was worried that the police might arrest me, but I did it anyway for the money. If I get out of here, I will go to help my parents working. He is likely to escape a heavy sentence because he's a juvenile. It's precisely the reason more and more youngsters are being exploited by the drug gangs. The traffickers like the quick money and the demand in the Thai market is increasing. The dealers are willing to take risks for profit. Cross-border trafficking of drugs from Myanmar has long been a problem for Thailand. Increased border security and a brutal war on drugs sent the traffickers into hiding only briefly. A new UN report shows the use of synthetic drugs while stabilizing in most developed countries is actually worsening in Southeast Asia. Experts say the drugs have found a new market among young, affluent Thais. People who use ice, uh, methamphetamine, crystal, uh, is the people who have more money to buy drug because it's more expensive than methamphetamine tablet. This is the drug squad's latest haul. At a laboratory outside of Bangkok, technicians sift through some 200,000 pills known locally as Yava or the crazy drug. The street value is around $1.2 million. Despite this recent bust, the UN suggests Thailand is actually seeing a decrease in tablet versions of methamphetamine and an increase in the crystallized form, like ice or crystal meth. Most of the drugs confiscated in Thailand end up here. This is ice, a highly potent form of methamphetamines. It's being tested and weighed and could potentially end up as evidence should this case proceed to trial. But it's a long and difficult process catching those at the top of the chain. 
For this teenager, he's the unfortunate intermediary in a much bigger battle that Thailand is desperately trying to win. Selena Downs, Al Jazeera, Bangkok. Tunjai Tanaychikan runs a small restaurant on the banks of the Mekong River. She cooks each day for dozens of tourists who come by boat, but she also often provides the first meal for North Korean refugees fleeing into Thailand. I offer them food and somewhere to sleep and shower. The chief of the village tells everyone don't help the North Korean refugees. It is illegal, but I feel pity for them. They are human like us. At 100 kilometers long, the Mekong is one of Thailand's most porous borders, a magnet for North Korean refugees seeking a better life. They come via China, usually by boat, like the one we're traveling in. This is their main point of illegal entry. This is one of the main smuggling routes down from China. We're actually on the border of three countries, Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos. It's an area known as the Golden Triangle, and for many fleeing North Korea, it's seen as a golden opportunity for freedom. Thailand has increased security along the Mekong to try to reduce the influx of refugees. With new arrivals each month, it isn't long before these two families are discovered. They've drifted into the bordered town of Chang Sen, hungry and exhausted, but relieved. They are safe. This woman didn't want to be identified. She fled with her husband and two sons. She's terrified the North Korean authorities will track down her relatives if they know she's gone. She and her husband worked in the coal mines, but all their money went to the state, making it difficult to leave. When they finally fled into China, the couple worked as cleaners, trying to avoid the authorities and save enough money to pay their passage to Thailand. It is very difficult to get food and clothes. The situation is not good at all. I want my sons to have the chance to go to school and go to university. If they are successful, I want them to go back and help the North Korean people. Korean businessman Kim yong hyu says it's no surprise refugees see Thailand as a beacon of hope. The main reason they leave North Korea is because they have nothing to eat, no work, no future. They hear that if they go to Thailand, they can be sent to South Korea, where they can have a better life. But their repatriation is a slow process. After a brief court appearance, they're sent to a local detention center. It may be another two years before they end up somewhere safe in South Korea or even the United States. For a mother, it's worth it, if only to see her sons grow up, enjoying the freedom she never had. Selena Downs, Al Jazeera, Northern Thailand.